everyone richard solomon and antonio seant that means this is a production of taking care of business and rocket green radio and we have an incredible special guest today our very very special guest is tegan who's with the perfect world foundation.org the perfect world foundation seeks to conserve wildlife and, and in this in this age it's, it's a real struggle Welcome to the show, Taken. And uh, to start, tell, tell us about what the Perfect World Foundation actually does. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very excited to be here. The Perfect World Foundation is a foundation that works around wildlife conservation. They help to raise awareness about endangered and um, species that are going to become extinct. And they are have many ambassadors who work with different missions based on their passion in order to um, raise awareness about their mission. Okay, and you're an ambassador yourself, correct? Yes. Okay, and, and what, is your, wow. what is your mission? My mission is elephant conservation and um, all over raising awareness about elephant poaching. There, there seems to be a, a huge problem with... I think is it we, we lose 96 elephants a day, roughly? Yes, we currently, the rate of extinction and um, killing for elephants is 96 a day, and that is one every 15 minutes. That's unbelievable. So in the course of our show, we're going to lose four elephants. Right. Yeah. Is that specifically uh, worldwide or just a specific area? where? Um, that's a generalization worldwide. Okay. Well, where do ele- where do elephants generally reside, and in what habitats do they reside in? So there are different types of elephants. Um, there are the Indian elephants, there are the African savanna elephants, and so they have different. Um, their ivory has different qualities based on where they live and based on how it has adapted. They have adapted to where they live. And so some ivory is hollow. Uh, there are also the forest elephants, but some ivory is hollow, some ivory is not, and there are different qualities. Okay. Well, okay. Now, they're being threatened only because people want to use their ivory, I, sent, it's, I guess, for artwork or, or carving? Um, so their mm-hmm. ivory, they're being poached for their ivory, Um, Their ivory is not just used for artwork. It is used in the illegal ivory trade um, for jewelry. It can be used for piano keys, as many old pianos were. Um, It can be used in guns, to inlay guns. Um, It can be used in many different ways. People use it because it's very pretty, and it also is um, malleable, so it's easy to work with. Um, It is the way that it's being taken is um, the poachers who come to kill the elephants normally, um, they're taking it and they're selling it on the illegal, in the illegal ivory market. Um, and money is putting, uh, or money is being put into the hands of different um, poachers and stuff armies. like that. Armies, yes. And um, things like the John Jaweed militia, and it's funding terrorism. Wow, huge problem. What 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 was the moment for for you when you heard about this issue and decided that you were going to take some personal action on that? Especially, I, I assume in your hometown there aren't any elephants like you just rolling around. You know, so it was like you grew up with them. You were right. <laughs> So I began my effort to save the elephants in 2013, so I was in fifth grade. Um, I was invited to a screening of the documentary Battle for the Elephants 
at the University of Vermont. And after the movie, I began educating myself on the importance of keeping elephants on this planet because it was something that as soon as I saw the movie, it struck me as I need to do something. Um, and I learned that the United States is contributing to the po poaching crisis by providing the second largest market for ivory in the world after China. And recent studies have found that more than half of the ivory on the quote-unquote antique market is um, in the U.S. is actually illegal and sourced from um, recently killed elephants. Um, and it's in some places it's as high as 90%. Wow. That is a very high percentage. Wow. I mean, it's ridiculous. So watching this film is what got you really um, to target into elephants? Is, is that, was that your, your main target, your main goal? Is, so my uh, main, <laughs> yeah, so my main target was originally elephants, and right. um, through learning about different animals, and um, I was actually invited last year to the International Conservation Chiefs Academy, which is at the Department of the Interior, and it's held in September. And rangers from the front line and wildlife enforcement officers come there to learn about um, their jobs and learn more about animals. And so I was invited to speak there and show my movie last year. And there I learned so much about different animals, and I wanted to further my reach um, in animal conservation. So I've started... Um, on a path of working with more than just elephants, but my main focus was originally elephants. Now, did, did you create the Perfect World Foundation? I did not, no. I. Um, or you joined it? I joined it um, a couple of months ago. I was asked um, to be an ambassador there because I had met the people from... Um, Lars and Rags Jacobson, who founded the Perfect World Foundation, um, they're from Sweden, and I had met them when I was in D.C., and they, I've just kept in touch with them, and they asked me if I would be an ambassador while I was at the U.N., so. Okay, so what, what in, the, in the course of a year, I, I know that there's different kinds of events that you either promote or participate in. There's the March for the Elephants. There's all kinds of stuff. Could you could you kind of give us a little bit of a of a calendar viewpoint of what a year looks like and what you do in the year to protect and defend the the, the habitats and lives of, of elephants and other of and other creatures on the on our earth? Sure. So originally, when I started, um, I testified at the State House right after seeing the movie. That's the Vermont and State House, right? Yes, okay. the Vermont State House, in support of Bill H-297, which would have banned the sale of ivory in Vermont. Um, it would have also banned the sale of mammoth tusk and rhino horn because um, currently um, ivory is being sold as mammoth tusk sometimes in order to make it seem antique enough to be legal. Um, and so I testified in front of the, uh, at the State House for that. And then um, I was invited back after doing a lot of research to testify again for the same bill. Um, and I, after the second test, after I testified the second time, I knew that I needed to continue. So when I, I joined a new school two years ago, and um, when I got there, my one of the so, the social studies department chair at my school um, is used to working with films, and he does filming as a hobby. So I went up to him in the first couple months of school and said to him, "Would you, would you um, like to do a movie with me on elephants and extinction?" And he was very excited about the idea. So we created um, this movie, the first original movie. And after that, I felt like I needed to do more. 
I just couldn't stop thinking about it. So um, we had the movie translated into Mandarin Chinese, and so that it would be able to have a further reach farther around the world. And um, that was when I, through that, I have been um, invited to the UN um, twice for World Wildlife Day. The first time I was invited to come and I was recognized on the floor of the UN, but I was invited to just come and watch um, and see what the whole CITES conference was about. And then um, after that, or actually before that, I was invited to Washington, D.C. in order to attend World Wildlife Day events. And that was where I was able to talk to different wildlife conservation activists and see their points of view and see other um, the other animals that they were working on. And then I went to an ivory crush in New Jersey What's this that? past summer. Wow. What's that? What's that? So an ivory crush is um, when... People gather together and um, they collect the ivory that they have that they want to get rid of and want to take off of, just destroy so that it doesn't have any worth anymore. Right, they want to get out of circulation, basically. Yes, Right. exactly. Wow. So um, one of the organizations that I work with was helping to run that. And so we gathered together, and I spoke at this Ivory Crush in New Jersey. And we, um, through that, I just learned so much from other people learning facts about elephants. Because it was so focused on elephants, um, there was so much that I could learn from being there. And then I went to the International Conservation Chiefs Academy. So that's sort of an overview of one year. Wow. Now, there are, I guess, certain benchmarks during the year. So you, you said there's, it, I forgot, is it March or October where there's the, the, the yearly March for the Elephants? What, what day is that on the calendar? That is in October. That's October. Yes. And is, is it nationwide, statewide, worldwide? And how do people find so, out about that? Um, it is worldwide. There are over 100 different, or 130 different marches. Um, the one that I led was actually in that year as well. Um, it was in Burlington, and we had people gather from all over Vermont in order to march in solidarity with the thousands of others who are marching in the same marches all over the world. And so we all marched, and um, I was actually, I know a resident artist um, in Vermont who, her name is Teresa Davis, and she owns the Davis Studio. And so mm -hmm. I went to her um, asking if we would be able to make something that would symbolize the 96 elephants that are killed a day. And so we had a long discussion about what would be the best thing that we could do to symbolize that. And so she came to me proposing an idea for, um, we had decided on elephant tusks because we knew that was the main thing that they were poached for. But she came to me proposing the idea to have our elephant tusks made out of pool noodles, which had been cut into quarters and then wrapped in plaster of Paris. So we made 192 tusks out of pool noodles, and we carried those in. We had different people carry them in the march, and then at the end we piled them up um, to symbolize all of the 96 elephants that are killed each day. Unbelievable. Uh, now, when you talk about uh, uh, people, are you talking about uh, students that have voices like you, or in general, uh, is are they from... Vermont, your area, or are they from uh, other places in the world? Where, 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 who are the people? 
So um, all of these people were from all over Vermont. Um, they are teachers, parents, students. Um, I had right. chosen a group of representative students that came up with me to um, while I was speaking to show that they had been making a difference at their schools. And they are all around my age from different schools all over Vermont. And um, they were kind of my representative, stu the representative students for their schools. So let's, let's start before we have a break, which will be in about mm, three minutes or so. What are the action steps we can take as individuals to actually help be part of the solution? Sure. So the number one thing that I have always said to anybody who wants to get involved is that they talk to, they educate themselves and then they talk to other people and spread the word because that makes so much of a difference. If people, if other people know and if other people are educated on the subject, then they will do something too. You can't do anything about the problem if you are not able to fix it because you don't know what the problem is. So once you educate people, they will take action as well. All right, so let me stop you there for one second. <clears throat> In terms of educating people, where can they go? Obviously to your website, uh, theperfectworldfoundation.org, but where else can they go to get some good, solid information that, you know, boils it all down to, you know, an easy-to-understand format. So the Perfect World Foundation is not actually my website, but um, you can definitely go there. Um, on my bio, there are action steps. Um, if, you, if you go to www.facebook.com forward slash a world with elephants, um, that is my Facebook page, and that is where I am able to, or that is where I explain the action steps that people can take. My movies are there, and um, that's where you can see what action you would be able to take. All right. And then okay. I would also recommend um, www.96elephants.org. All right. With that, we're going to have to. Uh, take a quick break. We'll be right back. This is Richard Salmon, Antonio Sion. This is Rocket Green Radio and Taking Care of Business. <clears throat> Pardon me. And we're with uh, Tegan, uh, who is really doing a tremendous job in helping to protect and save uh, elephants on the planet that we're losing at the rate of 96 a day. Keep it locked up. All right, welcome back. Richard Solomon, Antonio Sayant, the Rocket Green Team and Taking Care of Business, a co-production. Uh, we are with Tegan, and uh, we're, we're trying to help save the elephants. And I guess uh, Antonio and I are trying to do our part by getting Tegan's message out there to all of you uh, so you can actually be part of the global solution, which, which would actually be really, really nice. So, Tegan, we already kind of went through step number one, which is sort of education, self-awareness. But what can people do? Uh, because people like Antonio and I, we don't really see ivory in our day-to-day -day travels. We don't, we don't see it. We don't go to antique places. Uh, we don't go to places where, the, the, where you would see or, or come across, you know, tusks or rhino horns or, or any of those other things that, that we read about. So what, what, could, what could we do to be a part of the help? Yes, thank you. So um, the definitely number one thing is spreading the word, but also being mindful of your actions and not necessarily, um, I know many people are not dealing with ivory in their everyday life, but just being responsible and being knowing what you're doing, um, as well as the first question I ask myself is, why, why am I doing this? I'm halfway around the world, world for most elephants. Um, and I, so Vermont, because it is, or the U.S., because it is the second largest market for ivory in the world, um, there are so many 
different, um, the illegal ivory can just slip into here because there is a ban um, on ivory coming into the U.S., but we must ban, um, put place ivory bans in um, every state because once it is in the U.S., if there are no bans in different states, then um, the ivory just can make its way through. And currently, New Jersey is the only state without exemptions in their ban. Um, California, Washington, New York, Hawaii, and Oregon currently have bans with exemptions of different types, specifically based on what state they are. Um, who are your mentors? Um that, did you have any mentors in your life uh, that you you speak to about saving the elephants and and your action plan? Definitely, there. Um, I have had a lot of mentors um, throughout my work. Um, my original first mentor was Laurel Neamey. She is a writer for National Geographic. And she is one of the ones who got me introduced to the subject of the ivory trade. Um, and I originally worked with her a lot because she knows a lot about um, illegal markets for animal parts. Um, as well as um, Brian Christie, who is the founder and chief of the Special Investigators Unit at National Geographic. Um, I look up to him quite a bit for things that I need to know. Um, he's very um, on top of whatever is what everything that's going on in the illegal market for animal parts, as well as Jen Samuel, um, who is she's works for Elephants DC, and I have done a lot of work with her to further my passion for elephants. Have you ever got a chance to go to elephant preserves in either, you know, India or, you know, in the African savanna? I have been asked this quite a bit. I have never actually seen an elephant. I would love to be able to see an elephant um, in real life. And that is one of my dreams, but I have not yet. So, tell me about elephants as as creatures. They're they're supposedly smart. They're supposedly emotional. Uh, they take care of their young. What can you share with us about your knowledge about what, what, so, what what's it like when an elephant wakes up? You know, they go to work, <laughs> grab, <laughs> grab a coffee. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. So, um, elephants are all twisted altruistic creatures, meaning that they have a selfless concern for the welfare of others. And um, so what is happening right now is that even they have um, a selfless concern for the welfare of others, even outside of their species. But currently as humans, because of the poaching crisis, we are kind of lowering ourselves on their scale, I guess you could say. Um, they're becoming scared of us because of what we have done to their populations. Um, and they know it. They, they know, know it. They know and have memory. Yeah. Yes. And they also say that an elephant never forgets. They have, that is why it's difficult um, when a baby elephant goes through the trauma of having their mother killed for her ivory. Um there are actually sanctuaries that take care of baby elephants whose mothers have been killed because it they go through so much trauma and they don't forget that they that will be with them forever and so do do the males and females both have tusks the males and females both have tusks the males tend to be longer um but they're definitely more dangerous to hunt because they're so much bigger and stronger. Yeah. Generally. Just so you know, 
just so you know, I get invited to a lot of art galleries here in New York City, and because uh, I'm part of the uh, New York City art world. And I'll be honest with you, just like Richard uh, said, I have not yet seen ivory or any that type of exhibit in New York City at all, or any state so far that I've been. And I think if, when I'm talking about specifically New York City, I, I doubt we will ever see it, because I think today people would probably just not consider that as art, you know, because of what you're saying and mm-hmm. what's happening in the world today. So just to give a heads up, for me, and what I've seen, I have not yet seen ivory or uh, an exhibit of that. And I think if that were to happen, I think people today would definitely voice their opinion in probably a negative way. Well, how, how, Miss, let me follow up to Antonio's question or, or comment. How, how, how do you know when something actually contains ivory? So it, um, because we, maybe we've seen it, we didn't even know it when we saw it. So, yes, yeah, so um, sometimes it's hard to differentiate between um, faux ivory and real ivory. And that's why people, and also the age of the ivory is very difficult. Um, and a lot of times it is tested, but there are professionals who can test that and see the age of the ivory if it's real and different things like that because um, people are going to have their ivory tested because um, there's so much ivory that goes on the market, as I had said earlier, that is sh- um, is said to be antique but is actually not at all. And there is um, – people can um, – make the ivory look as though it is old or antique. They can age and, it. They can yeah, age they it. Can, age they can age the ivory, and um, there are people who are able to differentiate between legal and illegal ivory. Well, well, why would they allow antique ivory? Because ultimately it came from killing of elephants, whether it's current or years ago. Why, why did they make the distinction? Um, so it's difficult because no ivory generally should be sold because any ivory is going to increase the, um, trade and the demand for more. Um, I, I believe it's because it's, people believe that it's just old, so it's not going to make a difference if they sell it at this point because the elephant yeah but I think I think if people see this demand of it it's going to continue yes no yes and that's right that's the problem um with being able to sell antique ivory because antique any ivory will increase the demand and people Mm -hmm. will try harder and harder to um age the ivory so that it looks Mm -hmm. like antique ivory why, why is there such a demand in the United States for ivory? Because it, it seems, I don't know, it just it doesn't seem like something that people, to me, and maybe I'm just naive, it just doesn't seem like something that would just burst out as, as on the list of things you want or need or want to get access to. Um, this, this doesn't seem to make my list of like the top 10,000 10, things. So why do people want it? Yeah, so um it's because it's um it's usually not in you wouldn't usually see ivory in the general public um unless it was somehow um I'm somehow had gotten there um like it's jewelry usually, and so on. It's right? usually just... found in antique stores. Um, right. And that was one of the main reasons um, or problems that we had with Bill H-297, um, which our bill passed the House but was abandoned in the Senate because of a lengthy list of exemptions because we had many um, 
many antique dealers um, come and testify against the side that I was testifying for, be- saying that they're um, the amount of people that they normally get in their stores was going to decrease there um, because of the fact that people wouldn't be able to buy ivory anymore, which was um, one of the women that I work with did quite a bit of research, and ivory barely accounts for any of the um, any of the money that they are making. Have, have you ever done an internet search using a search engine just to see if anybody's actually selling ivory-based products? So I have not... Um, I've done a lot of research on statistics, but I have not done any specific research on if people are selling ivory in Vermont. Um, Currently, I've just been going off statistics, but that would be a very interesting thing to do. Because I'm wondering, you know, uh, aside from the soap that has the same name, uh, I I, I wonder what you would actually find if you look for it. Um, now, don't they, uh, Richard, don't they, um, I mean, I could have sworn that, uh, years ago, somebody told me that ivory also, uh, you see it in jewelry, in certain types of jewelry. Uh, is that true? I, I don't know. Would that be a factor too? Like certain people are using ivory for that just to basically show and tell, you know, for, uh, Cosmetic type looks, you know, and, uh, you know, wearing a bracelet or chain or something like that. That's what yes. I was told. That's, um, yes, that's one of the main demands. That's, uh, mainly in China, um, mm-hmm. that it is used for jewelry and, um, generally the wealthier parts of the population, um, <laughs> will buy jewelry that is. In, in, composed of ivory. In terms of the United States, is the, are there certain states in the United States that seem to have more of a demand for ivory than other places? Um, I have not done any specific research on um, the demand in specific states, but it's generally the states that are closer um, to different seaports and have easier access to ivory coming in from different parts of the world. Um, And in 2007, there was an ad campaign in China um, that communicated the origins of ivory, and it is estimated that 75% of the Chinese urban population saw the campaign, and the number of people who would subsequently buy ivory was cut in half. So bringing that back to um, what I had said earlier, that if people see, um, because so much of the general population doesn't see ivory in their daily lives, um, if people see the problem and they know that there is a problem, it is easier to do something about in, in terms of, because we only have like uh, two minutes left, in, in terms of your contact information, uh, I know you could you just repeat that your Facebook and, and other places that people can look up your information and contact you and maybe uh, try to offer their insights or maybe make donations or things like that. Where, where would they go? So um, my Facebook page is www facebook.com slash forward slash a world with elephants. And that is where the information, both of my movies that I've created are on there, um, as well as um, information on action steps and what the general public can do in order to take action on this issue. Um, Definitely check out... um, the Perfect World Foundation. They have a lot of information on not just elephants, but different species and what they have been doing. Um, 96elephants.org has great um, action steps as well as pledges that you can do. 
and all right so i'll tell you what, when we come back when we come back i'd like to talk about because we only have one more segment after this i'd like to talk about uh the two movies and uh sea turtles or rhinos uh penguins is it penguins Penguins. Penguins. Yeah, I know. Because I was looking for like the little, you know, the little birds and <laughs> from the <laughs> Antarctic. <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> you know, so, so when we come back, I want to talk about all of those topics. So keep it locked in. This is Richard Solomon, uh, Antonio Seant, Rocket Green Radio, taking care of business, co-production of our two radio shows on environment to, to discuss uh, environmental f- issues and put them in the forefront because it's really important that 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 we raise awareness of, of a lot of things that are out there that may not be making it to the traditional media and, and need to be heard and need to be voiced and need to be expressed. So with that, we'll be right back. Keep it locked in, and we'll be right back after this quick, quick break. Richard Solomon and Antonio Sayant welcome you back to our show, uh, Rocket Green Radio and Taking Care of Business. And we have taken on uh, with us uh, from Vermont. And uh, she is definitely a, a steward of the environment, uh, someone who's really uh, passionate and, and an inspiration uh, to a lot of people, in- including uh, your host. So, Antonio, uh, you're the filmmaker, so why don't you uh, take the next segment of questions? Sure. No, what I wanted to ask you, because I saw the film and, and uh, that you actually mentioned in the first segment, but um, Young Voices for Wildlife. Can you talk about how did you come about to organize and to start filming this with your teacher? And what is it about? And who's in it? And uh, what's the message that you're sending to me and Richard and to the world? Sure. So this second movie is Young Voices for Wildlife. This is actually the second movie that I've created. Um, This one was made specifically for World Wildlife Day this year, World Wildlife Day 2017. Um, And it does not only focus have a focus on elephants, but it's elephants, rhinos, pangolins, and sea turtles. And um, it has, it shows other species that are endangered as well. Um, And it talks about how Kids and um, young people like me can get involved in um, advocacy advocacy work. And the people who are in the movie are my classmates primarily, um, a lot of kids from different grades in my school. Um, Our school, the unique thing, one of the unique things about our school is that all the grades are very close. So I have people in this film from all different grades throughout my school. And it was wow. it was produced by um the chair of the history department at my school named Mark Klein Lucy. I saw the credit in the film at the end. I thought that was really cool. Um so you have you have two films and they're both up on YouTube. Yes. Okay. And then the one's so one's like a shorter version and one's the more extended version. So there are actually two completely different films. The original um, one that I had created was specifically about elephant poaching, which is on my Facebook page. Actually, they're both on my Facebook page, but you can view the short version and the long version of the movie Young Voices for Wildlife on YouTube or on my Facebook page. Now, let's let's kind of continue the journey. There's... So many, there's habitat destruction, there's loss of species. I I remember seeing in one of the movies uh, that there's been different cycles of extinction, but this is the first time in world history that this cycle of extinction is being caused by by people. Uh, Could you reflect on that? Yes, so there have been um, a couple, there have been quite a few mass extinctions um, in the history of our planet. This is the first and only so far to be um, completely related to humans and to human destruction of habitats. Um, We have had such, we have, because we are living, um, because of the way we are living and because of 
we are living in animals' habitats, and and they have no place are, to and they have no place to go. Yes, exactly. We are taking over all different habitats and polluting others. So, sure, I could understand that. You know, right? Cause, because because the, the, the I forgot how many people are on the in terms of the population, but uh, the Earth there's billions of people on this planet, and you know, I guess all those years ago, the population was much smaller. And uh, as it keeps expanding, we're losing rainforest. Uh, I read about in Soren, I think, uh, I don't know if it was your site or somewhere else, um, where they talk about, you know, rainforest destruction. And because if there's rainforest destruction, uh, there's multiple consequences in terms of habitat loss and weather changes and all kinds of other uh, things. Uh, plus, uh, we're losing, and, and I think you said this very clearly in the movie about the loss of diversity in terms of species. Do you want to reflect on that for us? Sure. Um, so, because of habitat loss, we're losing life's diversity on Earth is getting diminished um, because we're losing orangutans, for um, an example. Um, their habitats are being destroyed and it's not not related to um, normal Earth cycles. It's related no, to no us. meteor, no ice age. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> there's no meteor, no ice age. It's it's related to us, and we are also animals, and we just are kind of not respecting um, the general cycle and. Well, basically, we're we're devastating. We're changing the food chain. Yes, you we're know, changing the food chain. We've we've yeah. created so many things that we are the top of the food chain. Which is, there right. are definitely animals that are the top of the food chain, but it depends on their ecosystem and the environment that they live in, and we are kind of just creating our own. We're setting our own bar for the top of the food chain. Sure. Well, look, little insects like uh, bees is a big factor in our lives. You know, so if they go extinct, we're we're in trouble. That yes, we're, we're actually we're actually we're ac that's it's called colony collapse disorder, and we're actually in trouble already because if you think about it, fruit. Uh, things like almonds, the whole, the whole almond industry, I think California, is threatened because if if you can't have the pollinators go out there and do their job, then we can't have fruit and and things that require pollination, and that that destroys our food chain, um, and then all the other animals that that incidentally eat the same fruit that we do. Uh, and, sure. And, and, yeah, we. And it's billions of dollars, uh, you know, of, of produce. It's like a domino effect. It's as soon as one, as um, for an example, we can use elephants. If elephants were to become extinct, there are only or there are over a hundred species of trees, just trees that have to pass through the gut of an elephant in order to germinate. So we would lose hundreds of types of trees um, and diversity in the um, rainforest and forest of different places all over the earth if we were to lose elephants. And that's just one example. You know, there's a similar example. Um, I, I interviewed uh, a woman at Book Expo America who's an author of, uh, I forgot the, the exact title of the book, but it was like a, a way to um, reduce your sugar cravings by having sort of a sugar detox diet. And uh, she was saying that one of the problems is that because we tend to, as as humans, only eat very narrow spectrums of food, which is sort of like lettuce, tomato, onions, mushrooms, broccoli, whatever, that farmers are not making some of the more exotic kinds of foods or, you know, like, you know, I don't know, like red lettuce or, you know, red Swiss chard or whatever. Um, and as a result, because the farmers are not growing that stuff, that those kinds of important vegetables are disappearing from our diet because yeah, they're not being farmed and they're not being eaten. And so we're losing you know, that as well because we're eating too narrow of a band of food 
because you're supposed to have a, a, a very rich and diverse, very colorful diet of all kinds of vegetables and fruits of different colors because the different colors represent, I guess, different kinds of um, vitamins and minerals and antioxidants and, all, and photonutrients and all that stuff. Uh, so that that also is a parallel thing in terms of what we actually buy, because if you just buy the same things, um, sure, and it's too narrow, yeah. And also rolling that back into species, there are, um, as you were saying, um, crops are being grown, different types of crops are not being grown, um, and there are species that eat those crops as their primary food and are not able to eat those crops anymore once they are not being grown or are being taken out of their ecosystem. And it's kind of funny, too, um, especially in the U.S., we go to other parts of the world, and a lot of their food is um, what they have been eating for hundreds of hundreds of years, and um, they're diets are so diverse and things that we wouldn't even generally think of eating. And so... You mean grasshoppers? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, Richard, if you ever go to New York, I, I don't know the name of the uh, restaurant, but they sell exotic foods like that. And i I never been there, and I, I can't even imagine... You know, well, I, I did, a I, grasshopper. I, 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 I did. I, I did pass by a uh, a place where on as I was waiting for something to happen, um, the TV screens had you know one of those shows on uh, you know the cable uh, with the very interesting and unique foods from the world, and and I, I just don't know that I could eat like grasshoppers or ants. I just you know. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> and I know I definitely I, I, understand that. I, I know it's good protein and all the other stuff, but I just I don't know. Uh, nope. <laughs> gonna happen. I'll, I'll stick. I'll stick to buying the red leaf radish lettuce and the Swiss chard. <laughs> you know, the the unique. You know, the the, the purple radish or whatever. Uh, so, uh, tell us a little bit about sea turtles and rhinos and uh, not penguins, but penguins. Pangolins. Pangolins. Yeah. All right. So let's start with penguins. What I, I never saw that before until I saw your video because <laughs> when I when I heard peng, penguins, I thought it was you know the little the little seabirds, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which are also being threatened too in a different way. Yeah, because yeah. they have loss of the ice and other things uh, that are putting stress on their populations, and they're having to go further out uh, to fish. And th there's all kinds of threats to penguins. But tell me about this particular species. Definitely. So pangolins are now the most illegally traded mammal on the entire planet. They have an important ecological role in regulating insect populations because that is primarily what they eat. An adult pangolin can consume more than 70 million insects annually, and penguins are um, pangolins are being relentlessly wiped out um, by unsustainable by the unsustainable and illegal trade for their scales for medicinal purpose purposes. They're also being slaughtered for their meat and considered a delicacy in many cultures so around why, the world. So why is anybody just Not, trying to, to farm these guys or something like that? Um, I think it's difficult because they are illegal. Um, and if somebody was farming them, um, it would be difficult because it would be difficult to tell between oh, if you were legally killing these animals and if you were farming them, and it would also increase the de demand and people would start killing them even more. What is their natural didn't you do, Wait, oh, I'm sorry. Did what, he, go ahead. Didn't you do something at the UN a couple of months ago that they didn't exhibit uh, there with those type of birds? Or am I wrong? With, uh, I think it was Card and Olivia from One More Generation. And yeah. you, right? I, I so, believe so, no? Well, I was at the UN with Carter and Olivia they are working on a pangolin art project, and so they went to a school and they created this project where an artist had drawn a pangolin with no scales, and each um, person at the school, I believe, decorated a scale and they put it on the 
pangolin and presented it to the UN at World Wildlife Day where my movie was shown. Oh, that's cool. Well, yeah. What, where, where are their natural habitats? So they mainly live in the bushes um, in um, different parts of the world, generally like savannas, but like in the woods. And they, as I said, they eat the insects that are in there. <laughs> and are, are they being... Are they are they being illegally poached and exported, you know, around the world, or just uh, locally? Um. So. Or both. Both, definitely. It usually starts out local, but then as soon as the demand gets popular, then it, they go all over the world. So they're uh, considered a delicacy. Their meat, and then um, also their scales are ground up and used for medicinal purposes. Well, speaking of medicinal purposes, let's let's go to rhinos because uh, apparently the rhino horn is believed in some cultures to have medicinal value, although I've read reports that uh, there, there is almost no difference between what's in your fingernail and, and a rhino horn. Um, but, but let's talk about the, the rhino and, and sure. the pressures they're enduring. So rhinos have been roaming our planet for 50 million years. Um, poaching of these creatures has increased by 9,000% in just the last 10 years. Due to their demand um, for their horns in Asian countries generally. And so their horn is just exactly what your hair and fingernails are made out of. Um, it's believed in some cultures to cure cancer, which it actually statistically doesn't do. Um, there are only about 4,800 rhinos in the wild today. Um, and most uh, many species are extinct currently. Um, there's only one single male surviving northern white rhino in the entire world right now. Wow. Well, we only have two minutes left, so uh, let, let's let's put the, the 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 final touch on this. Um, there's only one left, but but what can we do to save the rest of them? To save the rest of them, we need to raise awareness. Um, that is what I was hoping my video would do by highlighting the fact that the um, there have been campaigns actually that go around and say clip your fingernails and send them to us. It's exactly like <laughs> having a rhino horn because it's exactly what your fingernails are made out of. So we just need to raise awareness about the fact that it's it's definitely those cultures believe what they believe is what they believe, but it's exactly what's in our hair and fingernails. So. Oh. All right, so in the last minute, the websites are... The websites are www.facebook.com forward slash a world with elephants. Um, the perfect world and 96 elephants.org. All right, that's going to do it for us. Tegan, keep up the good work. You're an inspiration to us and to many yes. of your peers and to people out there. Antonio, thank you as always. And for everyone out there listening, uh, Let's try to be part of a team of people who can actually go out there and, and make some positive changes. With that, thank you for listening. We'll see you in a week. Thank you for having me. Loved having you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Tegan Yardley. Did you know that our planet has lost half of its wildlife in the past 40 years? Tens of thousands of elephants are killed each year. Rhino poaching has increased by 9,000% in the last 10 years. Millions of pangolins have been slaughtered. The loss of our planet's creatures is eroding life's diversity on Earth. And the loss of diversity puts all life at risk. 
With the efforts of world governments, conservation organizations, and passionate individuals, we are making progress, but more must be done. Let us all do one thing today to help protect the world's wildlife. You might think, I'm just one person. What can I possibly do? But the truth is, we all have the power to do something, and the worst thing we can do is nothing. I have the power to be a responsible citizen. I have the power to educate myself and others. I have the power to change the way I think and act. I have the power to spread the word. I have the power to make a difference. If not me, then who? 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 If not me, then who?